My name is Tom Reitz. I am a student activist, and I am an unlikely activist. I grew up in a relatively conservative suburb called Plainfield, Illinois, and I had a bit of a tumultuous upbringing. Early on, I was in the foster care system, a state-funded program for youths whose parents had problems at home. My mother, diagnosed bipolar, suffering from alcoholism, was a loving yet troubled role model for me. I am also the son of a disabled American veteran who, following the death of my mother in 2010, raised me as a single parent on a fixed income. After high school, my father and I couldn't make ends meet, and I had to make my own way. While all of my newfound college friends were celebrating their first December break back from college, I was homeless, and I was scared. I call myself an unlikely activist because, like so many others, my journey to college was already statistically unlikely. Foster children are one of the most marginalized groups in the higher education system. But if you add family alcoholism, single parentage, and poverty, it becomes pretty hard to believe in yourself, that you can make an impact. From my statements, you could be guessing that this will be a cliche talk about how I pulled myself up from my bootstraps. It's not. I know that I still had a leg up because of white privilege, even though I started on a bottom rung. By the end of this talk, you'll understand why that is. But my goal for this talk is for each and every one of you to feel as willing as I just was in sharing your own lived experience. As an activist who tries to raise awareness and make an impact, my job is to reach people, even those who I disagree with. So I found that there are three things we have to realize in order for us to reach people who we disagree with. Our story, their story, and what both of those stories mean when they're put together. So it sounds simple, but the first step in reaching people who we disagree with is realizing our own story. During my sophomore year, a particularly controversial speaker came to my campus. For a variety of reasons, I helped organize a demonstration outside of the event in protest. The event was packed with both students and members of the general public. But when things began to wind down, only a few people remained. Some of them in arguments, others having calmer discussions. I saw it as an opportunity to engage not only those who I agreed with, but also those who I disagreed with. One of these people walked up to me. For the purposes of anonymity, I will call him Tim. He was white, tall, wearing boat shoes and a blue button-up. He confronted me by asking, why do you think all these protesters care so much? It's not like race matters anymore. He seemed to infer from my race and gender that I, like him, agreed with this controversial speaker. But in that moment, I was very tired. <laughs> my voice was hoarse, the day hadn't gone as I planned, and I just wasn't in a great mood. So I flat out told Tim that I thought he was wrong. And in apparent surprise to Tim that we weren't on the same side, he immediately pivoted and began reciting a carefully crafted argument for why he thought race didn't matter anymore. Naturally, my first reaction was to do the same thing, pull my talking points off the shelf. And I did. But midway through my almost mechanical delivery, it dawned on me that several people and experiences I had lived through influenced me far more than any other statistic or talking point. In other words, I realized that my story was really important to why I believed what I believed that it would probably be the same for Tim. So I shared stories with Tim. I realized my story. We started at first by talking about people who influenced us. Then I shared my story and my upbringing. And then I started to share stories of people who I had grown up with in the foster care system, whose parents had been given harsher sentences, not because of the crimes they had committed, but because of their race. I reluctantly engaged with Tim in a pretty long and personal conversation. He was defensive at first, like before. But we, at that moment, laid down our metaphorical weapons. He looked at me and he said, I didn't know about all that. I guess that would suck. We, at that moment, 
forgot our political allegiances and had a discussion about something real. This was made possible because I made an effort to engage with and share my story with Tim. So, the second step in reaching people who we disagree with is listening to their story. In working through our own story, we have to go through so many emotions. Fear, anger, embarrassment, and vulnerability. But uh, realizing your own story is really helpful in understanding why you hold certain beliefs. To take the next step, we have to listen to other stories. From our conversation, I learned that Tim was a part of what is officially known as the Manosphere, a subculture of men who traverse internet forums focusing on subjects like pickup culture, masculinity, and men's rights. I bring up the subject because many of you might not have known that the alt-right, the political faction that has been dominating headlines because of its opposition to social justice, is just made up of people like Tim. Tim has grown up less likely than I to perceive racism as a problem that affects Americans today. And had I not listened to him, I wouldn't have understood why. Tim shared that he was working in a trade that might not exist in a few years, that he hadn't been able to go to college, that he was angry, and he was scared. Tim shared that he was beginning to identify with the alt-right, and because of our conversation, I think I understood why. He feels socially excluded. Tim told me that he was far less likely than I, a college student at a liberal arts university, to personally know people from marginalized communities. His demographic, men from the ages of 18 to 25, are less likely to have obtained a college degree. And those who don't have a college degree have a workforce participation rate that is declining faster than any other age and gender group. Tim told me that he was feeling socially excluded from mainstream society because of this. His demographic tends to spend more time online and away from others. But I realized that in that moment, because he was less connected, he was probably also feeling excluded from discussions surrounding race. A study from social psychologists at Princeton University linked to this feeling, the perception of social exclusion to being more willing to hold extreme and sometimes conspiratorial beliefs. I remember feeling similarly when I was growing up, but I shifted my views later. See, I had the privilege of, because of my race and gender, of not feeling threatened by Tim's presence as a man in a chaotic environment. In fact, we were able to find a lot of common ground, a lot of things that we had lived through that were similar. You see, we had basically the same identities, but it was our values that had ended up drastically different from one another. And because I listened, I was able to understand both of our stories, that while both of our stories were very different, they were both real experiences. This is the third and final step in reaching people who we disagree with. Understanding what happens when we add our stories together. The privilege that being a straight white man entails is real to me, because I've also seen privilege firsthand in the foster care system, where non-white people and those in the LGBT community go through what I did, but with vastly different outcomes. I met other children who were in the foster care system because their parents couldn't accept that they were gay. I had parents who accepted me for who I was. Not everyone else did. I knew that I was lucky, but little did I know that privilege was the term for what I was feeling. Tim and I clearly disagreed about several topics, but he kept asking me why he should recognize his privilege when so many other people who, who were white clearly had disadvantages in their life. We, unfortunately, had to cut our discussion short at this point, as Tim had to leave. But I really wish I had the chance to answer his question then. If I had had a few more minutes with Tim, I would have asked him to add our stories together and to add other stories to his. I've realized since meeting Tim that someone else's experience of oppression can be true without contradicting his personal story. This is why it's so important that we genuinely believe someone 
when they share their lived experience. This is what I wish I would have been able to share with Tim. That my experience of poverty was just as valid as my other peers' experience of racial and sexual orientation related oppression and valid just like Tim's experience of social exclusion. See, I realized that both of our stories existed next to one another. By adding our stories together, I've been able to realize the humbling truth that though I care about social justice and equality today, it took me a very long journey to get here, and it would probably take a long time for Tim as well. How many of you, by show of hands, have ever said something offensive? Perhaps something racist. You see, this is what Tim should have asked me, because it means that we are all on a spectrum of awareness. I am not perfect, no matter how aware I think I am. And because I was adding our stories together, I began being able to bring people like Tim with me in this journey into this uncomfortable admission. Since then, I've been able to communicate to people like Tim the real reasons why I care about social justice, why I recognize my white privilege, and why certain comments were offensive or degrading to marginalized people. Since then, I've been able to articulate white privilege to my white family, friends, and colleagues who might not have seen things the way that I did. By adding stories together, I've realized that we can and do have the power to reach people, but we just have to realize how to add our stories together. When we do this, we get a new story as well. If we all do this, we can help people like Tim in becoming more aware of problems facing diverse communities and also become better equipped ourselves to reach those who we disagree with. See, I firmly believe that if we realize these three ideas, it can work, but we shouldn't expect it to always work. I've been called a social justice warrior and a liberal snowflake too many times to think that it will. What we should try is to plant seeds, stories that will one day perhaps inform someone's beliefs. If we realize these three ideas, our story, their story, and our stories put together, we can find the power to reach people. But we have to take it to heart, to connect through our lived experiences. If we do, the radicalization of people like Tim and trends like the alt-right can be reversed. But we must remember that this will take far more than just carefully crafted arguments. We have to figure out how to reach people, how to share what we've gone through and what we know to be real. Thank you.